Today we will be looking at something I covered once before, but with a text-to-speech AI and not enough details. I didn't intend to cover this topic again, but this was a performance demanded of me and I shall deliver. Emphasis on the word deliver. Next time you consider making a joke about FNAF fanfiction, I want you to remember the topic of today's video. The Fazbear Frights books were a peculiar bunch of books. They were virtually goosebumps knockoffs that occasionally had themes of, or on the rare chance, characters from the Five Nights at Freddy's series. Normally, when animatronics did appear, they were either inaccurately portrayed or just hallucinations that didn't do anything. Don't get me wrong, there were a few good stories that were genuinely good, but the more books got pumped out, the more processed and lifeless they became. None of this being more obvious than the time they introduced Fazgoo, a mix of the blob, not that blob, this blob, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, just with Faz written in front of it. A lot of the series itself felt like a lot of Fazgoo, a Faz-named product vaguely shaping itself to be a story. But there was one story that was so baffling, so utterly confusing, something that felt like it came off of a secretive internet forum, or on one of those creepy YouTube kids videos that portrays pregnancies and fetishy materials that shouldn't be anywhere near kids. Ironically, planted in a book that has been sold in elementary school book fairs. We're talking about In the Flesh, the canonical FNAF, Impreg, and C-section story. No, I am not kidding, it's not implied or ambiguous, this is the actual plot of the story. So, the baby daddy is a guy named Matt who's in a few short words a jerk. He has anger issues, he uses his only friend, he insults women, and he's generally an unpleasant person. Fazbear Frights and Tales of the Pizzaplex have had their fair share of shallow protagonists. They're usually described by one trait alone, such as sad, or lazy, or overworked, vain, self-conscious, and so on. Sometimes they're just comprised of issues with their parents. Some of them are largely abused by the universe, and others are so awful that they deserve to die. But a majority are just these one-note blank slates. Matt is the angry and deserves to die type. He has severe anger issues. Like I said, he has trouble with women and with dating, and he tends to make it everybody else's problem, including the unfortunate person stuck going out with him. He also takes it out on his work. Matt is tasked to make a VR maze game with Springtrap, but instead he uses the game to vent his frustrations. He tortures the Springtrap inside, taking a sadistic pleasure in doing so. Yet somehow he ends up channeling that anger inside of the Springtrap program. Yet instead of, oh I don't know, Springtrap becoming bloodthirsty, trapping Matt in the game and then trying to kill him, the story takes a rather unexpected turn. An unexpectedly ungodly turn. So, Matt finds Springtrap unresponsive, and when he touches him, he gets a weird feeling, unknowingly infected by him. While he doesn't realize it at the time, a throwaway side character who isn't worth bringing up notices a file created called It's a Boy. And yes, it is exactly what you think it is. Somehow, Matt becomes even more angry, or moody. He starts feeling sick and gets especially hungry, gorging himself and putting on weight. He has thinning hair and a slight change in skin color, some bloating, some movement around his midsection. You know, all the typical pregnancy symptoms. And before you ask, yes, hormonal changes can cause changes in skin color in patches or all over. Someone did their research on this. I read that he was supposedly turning into Springtrap, but like, if that's the route you wanted to go with, you should have gone all the way with that one. Inching towards the climax while Matt's about eight or nine pages along, he starts to go on a couple of dates. They are all disastrous as the story goes out of its way to show how irredeemably awful Matt is. On one, he immediately calls off the date because the girl is too big. And he actually says it to her face. Then he gets embarrassed when she points out that he looks heavily pregnant. During another one, in an especially jerkish move, Matt is invited on a double date with his roommate Jason. Yeah, that's another reused name there, by the way. He decides he likes Jason's date better, and spends all night ignoring his date and trying to pick up on her, asks her out, and then is shocked when she says no, and storms off without paying. And that is, of course, after gorging himself. She ends up telling Jason, who becomes upset, There's no time for that. Matt gets home feeling rough, unknowing that he is going into labor until he starts feeling pain and pressure, and looks down to see something moving around in his stomach, 
trying to push out of the skin. He grabs a kitchen knife and cuts himself open, as one typically does in this situation, and out pops a baby spring trap. Not to be confused with plush trap, that calls Matt daddy and cuddles up to him as he dies. I don't think you die from this, admittedly. People have been cut open in accidents and survived for a surprisingly long amount of time afterwards. But whatever, he's sick. Maybe he hit an artery while filleting himself. The police and Jason find him later, but there's no sign of the baby spring trap. Though Jason does notice a lump of slimy green fur soaked in mucus and amniotic fluid. Now imagine reading that as a child in third grade. Imagine picking up Bunny Call thinking you're about to read about animatronics and reading this. This has got to be so confusing for a kid. Sure, there are cartoons that make impreg jokes, but there's a huge difference to a cartoon making a joke than this. This book ought to come with a warning label for an adult, too. That's the reason Archive of Our Own has tags. I just wanted to chime in here. I realized while re-listening to this for editing that the way I worded this makes it seem like male pregnancy is the disturbing part here, and that's actually not the case. To be absolutely clear, it is not the fact that Matt is a man who gets pregnant that is the disturbing part. It is the fact that he is forcibly impregnated, has a realistic pregnancy, then has a graphic self-inflicted C-section. 9, the Stitch Punk doll movie with no blood, was rated as PG-13, and this disturbing display of borderline mature content is being sold to kids who are likely 6 to 10 years old, sold in a venue where their parents won't be observing the material before they get their hands on it. And while I am sure parents can be overprotective, there is a reason websites like fanfiction have a minimum age for sign-up that starts at 13. But what else would you expect from a series that made a realistic story about the tragic life and death of a child suffering from cancer and has raised money for children cancer hospitals, only to turn around and allow a story about a fast-spreading VR super cancer that's killing everybody left and right? Mm-hmm, yeah, great quality control there, guys. But the worst part of the story is that the impreg is the only thing that saves this from being another bland rehash of a premise. Another VR story of a person seeing things in the game, and if you die in the game, you die for real, in another rabbit possession, it's just now a lot more uncomfortable, and not in a scary way. In a, I feel like people are going to judge me just for reading this kind of way. There is also so much filler. The sections devoted to dates could have been chopped in half. You could have just had the double date, and that would have still shown how much of a garbage person Matt is. At this point, Matt's pretty much a caricature, so there's no point in the rest of these. And I get the through line. Matt is awful to women, so he gets to experience something that is stereotypically feminine. Pregnancy. Honestly, I think the story would have worked better if they just took the plunge and just had Matt program an animatronic he's working on to be his girlfriend and then have it go terribly wrong. Or perhaps just straight up turn him into Springtrap, go that route. Let's take a look at both options. Option number one, under my skin. Matt is a jerk and is bullying his Springtrap program to get his kicks when the whole infection thing happens. However, instead of getting pregnant, something else happens. Matt is changing, but in a different way. His skin is changing color. He's feeling weird bumps and lumps over his body. His breath is starting to reek. He's always hungry. He keeps eating, but he always feels empty. When he goes on the double date, everyone's off put by him. And when he asks the other date out, not only is she offended that he's backstabbing his friend, but she throws in that he smells like he's rotting from the inside. He feels like it too, until the point that he gets home. Maybe during another anger spell, he's throwing stuff and ends up bumping his arm. His skin tears, and there's something rotten and green underneath. He's horrified. He tries to cut it out, but more of his skin is peeling off. As he's decomposing before his very eyes, he looks into the bathroom mirror and sees the hollow horror of spring trap as parts of his face sloth away. He was always on the inside. The police and Jason find Matt, and there's either one or two outcomes. Ending one, there's kind of just rot and gore at the scene and no body. They question Jason, but can't figure out what happened. The coroner later investigates the remains and says that they're his, but it is as though he rotted away years ago, and it's weird that there's no sign of his bones. Ending 2. They find Matt's body having bled out from cutting into himself. There was no spring trap. Matt had hallucinated him and attacked himself, 
Or perhaps he had been possessed by Springtrap, who had finally gotten his revenge in the one way he knew how. That would kind of play in more to the help wanted VR glitch trap scenario. That's one possibility, but during my last video, I came up with an entirely different story, which I will now indulge you with. Option number two, Matt cleans up his act. Matt is a jerk. He has a volatile past with women, but he cannot see his own flaws. He has a temper that he can barely control, takes advantage of his friends, and longs for a stable girlfriend, but not out of companionship but as a would-be caretaker who would clean up the apartment and do the stuff he doesn't want to, such as cooking and cleaning. His last girlfriend left him because he expected her to do all the chores around the house and then was rude to her and always bossing her around, belittling her. She specifically said that he treated her like a live-in maid. Ready to get himself a new babe, Matt goes on a series of failing dates that we only brush over. He cannot keep himself in check and thus cannot get a woman even willing to go on a second date, let alone commit to be his girlfriend. He is judgmental, abrasive, and an all-around, very unlikable person. He is also a technician at an animatronic rental company. One day he sees a rather easy-on-the-eyes animatronic, perhaps a variation of Ballora, specifically a version of Ballora who is programmed to clean up after parties. Seeing an answer to his problem, Matt decides to reprogram and steal the bot sneaking it home. At first, life with the bot seems pretty great. She does whatever he says without complaint, and he's not required to put in the same effort as if he was dating her. However, the maidenette has a learning AI, and over the course of their time together, she begins to study Matt, and eventually, she begins to grow attached. She starts asking more questions about the chores, repeatedly, to get him to talk to her. He finds her standing over his bed, and sometimes she touches his arm. His reactions are typical of him, lashing out, snapping at her, and soon he gets uncomfortable enough or comfortable enough to start insulting her the same way he used to insult his girlfriends. It finally gets to the point where he forcibly turns her off. I imagine something along the lines of him popping open her back panel and tampering with her, with, with her unable to stop him as it is against her programming. Though after a few days of having her sitting in a corner with a sheet over her, the dishes aren't done, he's got a bunch of dirty clothes laying around, and he dares to turn her back on to return to doing daily chores. He asks her to go back to cleaning and tells her that he'll shut her back off if she doesn't. Maidenette agrees to clean the entire house from top to bottom, and he notices that her voice sounds more robotic and cold. Assuming the reboot fixed her, he goes about his business. Either Matt falls asleep on the couch or leaves for work. If he leaves for work, I'd expect that he was then fired for stealing an animatronic, and this can play into a plot point later, but that aside. After he wakes up or comes home or whatever, Maidenette tells him that there is only one thing left that is dirty. Him. And she has run him a bath. He is reluctant at first, but eventually she convinces him to take the bath, perhaps under the suggestion that she cannot shut down until the task is complete. So he does. When he gets to the bathroom, he notices a strong chemical smell. She explains that it is cleaning agents. He looks around and sees that she has practically scrubbed the bathroom, the toilet, the sink, everything is spotless and white, so he believes her. He starts get to get into the bathtub. He has a bad feeling when he realizes she isn't leaving. Eventually, he gets a foot in the water, and it burns, not from heat, but from something much worse. He tries to get out, but Maidenette overpowers him. She forces him into the water, revealing that she is much stronger than he believed her to be earlier. The acidic concoction of chemicals burns his skin and lungs, and he can't stop but scream under the water. The last thing he notices is the silicone gloves on her hands are starting to melt away from the concoction. It cuts to some time later, after Robotics has located their stolen maidenette, and due to Matt having signed waivers, they are allowed to enter into the house to find her. They find Matt's remains, or the soupy mixture left afterwards, still in the bathtub, Note, but since this is aimed at a younger demographic, it might be best to just show a technician's reaction to Matt's remains instead of discussing or describing them in detail. In fact, if we're aiming this towards a younger audience, the scene with the maidenette definitely needs to be toned down and just more implied than shown in graphic detail. The technicians lament that they're probably going to have to call the police and figure out a story to explain this. They're confused how Matt could have made this seemingly docile bot react in such a way. She's damaged, but she has shut herself down, so they are able to wheel her out and into the van. 
On the way, one of the technicians remarks that Matt shouldn't have started tampering with the programming. He must have taken out the safety measures. Then the story ends. It's really sort of the first thing that I thought of, but I think this could have worked. Now, I know I took Springtrap out. There's nothing about the story that really screams Springtrap anyway. He could have been replaced with Grim Foxy, the actual Maze Runner, or another character entirely. When the theme is Guy has trouble with women, having Springtrap be the face of the repercussions is... odd. The important changes in the story are the cause and the effect. There is one huge bump in In the Flesh that throws it off, and that is the jump from jerkish guy programming Springtrap in a maze who is killing clones and investing us in this virtual world to forget the game, forget the world, Matt's pregnant with Spring's self for Offspring. I just realized that Offspring could be a pun here. That aside, what does Springtrap have to do with pregnancy? How did we get from haunted animatronics to viruses that somehow break the boundaries of human anatomy and biology to impregnate someone without even direct contact? And why is there so much filler in the beginning about Springtrap killing other Springtrap clones and glitches, only to suddenly become a pregnancy story? The only connection with the assumed theme, being how he treats women, would be the getting pregnant thing. Except that's sort of a jump, it's not like he keeps pressuring his girlfriends to get pregnant before they were feeling ready and drove them away, which would branch to him then feeling what it's like. In this version, Matt does not treat women like people, but servants. He gets a robot to use as a servant. He treats it in a similar manner to his ex-girlfriends, but it is not a human, so it reacts in a less than human way. There's also the factor of Matt walking into his fate. It's not just him being a jerk, an unreasonable jerk. He actively leads to this happening step by step. There's numerous times where he could have made a better choice and things would have been better. But over and over again, he doesn't, and that makes him look like worse of a person than him just insulting people at a restaurant. Again, this is not perfect, but something I thought might be a little more relevant to FNAF. I don't think they would have gotten away with the pregnancy plot if it was a woman, though, to be frank. But they shouldn't have gone ahead with this at all. It's not scary, yes, but it's also not FNAF. FNAF is about haunted robots, pizza chains, androids, hallucinations and illusions, magic cloning goo, a lot of people killing themselves, child abuse, and filler. Pregnancy does not need to be in the equation. Think of the children. Or God, think of the parents who are going to have to explain to their children where babies come from after they read this story and start having nightmares that some guy in a rabbit suit is going to touch them and impregnate them. Now that I have thoroughly put a foul image in your head, thank you for watching.